All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Before we dive in today's episode, I want to thank you for tuning in and supporting the brand. Over the last few years, I spent a lot of time starting Farmer Grade. We offer meat that you and your family can trust by strictly sourcing our cuts from farmers who share their story and processes online through social media. We provide high quality beef and pork that is 100% born, raised, and harvested in the United States. If you want to support the content and the message we share online, I would appreciate it if you went over to farmergrade.com and you can use the code BARNTALK to save 10% off your next order. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. We love you. Now, let's get into the episode. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays in the barn, but not today. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today is going to be a special episode. We got a guest coming on and we're going to talk farming. Um, But before we get into it, you guys know the drill. Pay the fee, share the show with who you know. The more that you guys do that, the more the show grows, the more people we can reach, the better guests we can get on, more episodes we can make. You can also uh, if you submit questions for our Q&A episodes. You can email us those questions at barntalkshow at gmail.com to get them answered on the show. Um, you can leave a review on Spotify or Apple. We're up to 2,000 five-star reviews on Spotify and Getting closer and closer to a thousand on Apple, so keep doing that. Just gives our show more credibility, and we're also still doing a raffle for the month of January. So, uh, to enter into the raffle to win a free box of meat that we raise here on our farm, our pork. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, comment your favorite part of this episode, and subscribe on YouTube. If you're listening, head over to Spotify, and in the prompt below what do you think about this episode let us know what you think about the episode and that's how you can enter um yeah we appreciate every single one of you guys thank you so much for um all your support and we're really looking forward to getting into this episode how are you doing today i'm good good i'm excited for this one yeah you are you are excited this is one that we've been trying to do for a little bit now yeah we, we we did we got we've been trying to put this together for a while it's kind of a double shot because uh, I will be appearing on uh, our next guest's uh, new YouTube channel at some point in the future. So uh, we kind of killed two burns with one stone today. So today we are talking to a guy that was born into dairy farming. And he milked and he toiled and he toiled and he milked, dreaming about someday maybe having a day off and uh from those humble beginnings he would go on to become a true multi-sport champion like you know they talk about bo jackson uh they talk about Dion sanders but uh this guy he he farms he trucks he tiles and he's pretty good at all of them but his true calling is being a tiktok titan <laughs> with over 46,000 subs on TikTok and a brand new YouTube channel, he's roaming the countryside in search of a great tractor story and maybe a hot deal on a cab over. Without any further ado, let's get into it. So Ryan Kelly, yep. thanks for coming. Welcome to Barn Talk, better known as Wisconsin Titan. Yep, Wisconsin Titan 2. We tried to, Wisconsin Tyson Titan 2. Uh, we tried to have this podcast happen two weeks two weeks ago, but the crazy ass snowstorm that went through the Midwest slowed us down a little bit. And honestly, I think he would have made the trip. Oh, yeah. But we got stuck, we, and it was kind of a shit show around here. So we had to tell him. We I don't weren't know. worried about him getting here. Yeah. We were just afraid you were going to get here and then you weren't going to fucking leave. <laughs> And we were like, I, I, I mean, I think I like yeah. this guy, but I don't know if I want him to stay here for like three days. Well, and, and the unfortunate part about not making it down two weeks ago is it really screwed up my candidacy for president because I was really hoping because <laughs> when you invited all the all the candidates yes. down, I got on the list right away. But now my caucus numbers just aren't there because I wasn't able to promote through you guys. So I guess 
I'm the best thing I can hope for now is I'm I'm hoping Tony will put me in his cabinet. I want Secretary of Agriculture. Yes. There you go. Or yes. or I want to be in charge of the EPA. Yes. Perfect. Both of those I would I would <laughs> I would back you on that. Yeah. I would back you. You got our 100%. endorsement. If, if Tony yeah. gets elected, I wouldn't suggest investing heavily in deaf companies. No, I would I, not. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. Yep. Thousands. That's percent. pretty good. Yeah. It is. You uh you are a man of many talents. Uh you're like you're like the triple you're like the triple threat of TikToks because you are trucks, tile, and tractors. Well, I thought you were gonna say like thirst traps, and I'm like, yes, I know. <laughs> the you're like ladies the Bo- are always throwing themselves at me. <laughs> you're like the Bo Jackson of farming, you yeah, know, yeah, playing there baseball. You go. Deion Sanders yeah. playing baseball and football, but you're in all of it. Well, it's out of desperation. So first generation farmer. Yep. Um, I say that. I'm not a first generation farmer. I have a first generation farm. Right. Fifth generation farmer. None of us on the same farm. So I'm jealous that you guys have that, like I told Torque earlier, like those heirloom yeah. things. Like I don't have my great grandpa's signs or any of that kind of stuff. But um they're a dairy farm. Um went to crop farming. Wasn't enough to just crop farm have to make income doing something else so it was trucks in the intermediate you know because i went to school right after right after high school i got into trucks um went to school for it and then been so around. yeah so you went to school for like diesel mechanics yeah they call it heavy duty truck technology duty which makes it sound like i'm an engineer That's but sexy. no yeah yeah so you were you did that but then you kind of you got the bug like to get us to truck um Believe it or not, sitting in the seat of one is easier work than it is climbing underneath one and trying to wrestle a drive shaft up and, right. you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so which came first? So you you went to school, but then were you trucking when you started farming or did you start farming and then were that realized, all right, I got to make some extra money and you knew or did it all kind of come together? Well, it's complicated there because, so I wouldn't have went to school at all. Like I, my plan was similar to Sawyer's, like where I was going to get out of high school and I was just going to farm. Um, I had dairy cows with my parents. Yep. Um, at the time they still were, they were contract, they weren't contract feeding. They, they supplied the facilities and hauled manure and maintained our own buildings for a guy that was raising breeding stock for hogs. Okay. And then I was always helping. If I wasn't at home, I was at neighbors all the time. And my plan was, well, between all that, I'm just, I'm just going to farm. That's, and my mom, uh, did not think that was a good idea. Um, my dad was not a, my dad did not love dairy farming. So she said, you know, all my talk of going just farming, she goes, we're selling the cows. We're selling your cows with our cows and you're going to go to school for something and two things led me to heavy duty truck technology, as they put it, was first thing was growing up, I always thought, um, you know, trucks were kind of cool because growing up in an era where Smokey and the Bandit. Oh, was, yeah. We think Snow of truck Man. driving today. We kind of think of a guy that's in flip flops and sweatpants. <laughs> and yeah. It's like, uh, but <laughs> as a kid, Snowman. Yeah. Gary Reed. You're Damn like, right. You know, that's as cool as it gets, you know. 100%. So I always thought trucks were cool. Um, but then the other thing was truck engines were always more advanced than farm equipment. And yeah. I thought it would be a, an advantage to know more about that for tractor pulling. Sure. Honest to God, tractor pulling played a big <laughs> part in my future. So you, what you're saying is you weren't an economics major by any means. Later on, I did. <laughs> so I, I ended up going back to four year college. I never finished. I just got too busy on the farm. But so anyways, long story short, um, went to the heavy duty truck technology um, the intention was not to even work in the field. And then I'm going to school with these guys that uh, were close to Minneapolis, St. Paul. These guys had jobs already in the industry, you know, working as part-time while they're going to school. Yeah. And you know, the neighbor would give me $5 an hour to milk cows for him. And these guys are like working part-time and you know, and this is mid nineties, yeah. late nineties. And they're, they're working part-time for like $15 an hour. And I'm like, damn, wait a minute. 
So then I kind of, yeah, I kind of got into that. And, and then I was like, well, I'll, I'll drive. And it was in that time frame that I was like, I really miss farming. So I made the decision that I had to, I was going to get back to farming somehow. Yeah. And then I, so I went on my own at 21. I, I bought, you know, I started farming on my own at 21. Um, by 22, I had dairy cows again, and I was working out and milking cows. And then, um, your mother probably was not happy. No, no, I don't hear my mom swear a lot, but she did have some words when I, when I finally, so I ended up working in the city's really good job, union job, um, you know, being a mechanic and hauling heavy equipment. Yep. So that was really good pay up there. And I used all that to get my own dairy farm yep. bought and transition to that. And she was like, you are an effing idiot yep. when I quit my job. And my banker is so funny because I bought that. And he's like, yeah, you can cash flow this. You have a really good job. He says, I know what you're up to. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And he's like, I get it. Yep. But he's like, can you give me like six months Yeah. To, to figure this out before you just quit your job and start milking cows? And yeah. Yeah. So then, and when the dairy cows left, it's like, you know, I had the, the land base for a 50 cow dairy and, and young stock. Well, that wasn't enough to make a living on. Mm -hmm. And being a one-man show, um, I didn't have the, uh, you know, the help where, and I was somewhat spread out. So it's like, it wasn't just a hobby. So that was that choice when I sold the dairy cows was, was, okay, this could just be somewhat of a hobby. I could sell most of my equipment. Um, I owned at the time, I only owned 41 acres on the building site. And I went, well, I could probably hold on to that, you know, keep a tractor or two and yeah. I could fiddle around on my 41 acres while I could go back and finish my four-year degree and, you know, and, and get that kind of a job. Yeah. I go, or I just want to farm. I need something that it fills it, in the gaps. Yep. And you can't have that nine to five job where you have to schedule your time off, you know, Oh, six months from now, we're going to plant corn this right. day. So I'm going to put in my, my yep. week off mm -hmm, this right. time. I was like, you need something flexible. Yep. I could fix trucks. So then I bought an old cab over. And then, so I, what was your first truck you bought? Uh, the first one I bought was a 83 GMC Aero Astro. Ooh, nice. Cab over, cab over. 2,500 bucks or 3000 bucks. And I was hauling grain with that, bought an old Wilson hopper. Yep. Um, and then I started driving for another guy, too. And then I was like, well, this is stupid. I own a truck, and I go haul grain, and then I drive his truck. And I'm like, that's dumb. I might as well just have my own truck doing all this stuff. So I was like, well, me and the cab over are going to go. And I, there was a guy that I've known since I was young. You know, they had a trucking company. And I was like, hey, I want to come over and be an owner-operator for you. And he goes, you know what? Yeah, that's that's great. And I said, well, I'm bring my cab over and he goes no i don't i don't want your three thousand dollar gmc <laughs> yeah. cab over pulling you, for me yeah he goes you you can buy a little better truck he says i'll help you out here he had and he had like a 2000 freightliner yep um he goes the clutch is out of it it needs some stuff but he goes i'll, I'll sell it to you right and he goes i'll give you all the parts you need to fix it he says yep. but you got to fix it yep I said good deal and and then you and that off. i called that freight that 2000 freightliner I paid ten thousand dollars for it, and this was like oh nine or ten, probably ten. And he gave me all the parts to fix it. I paid ten thousand dollars for it. I called that truck the ATM because anytime you needed money, he just went to it, took off, just, and just go drive it. Yep. Mm -hmm. You because you know, I mean, there's that's that's some guys three months worth of truck payments, right? You know, right. and I kept that old fruit liner running yeah. and you know and then i was able to buy more land and yep. you know yeah so you had the 40 acres you had some dairy cows and then you trucked and fixed you just were hustling to just try to try keep to it all going something going and so, then yeah. did you when did the tiling come into the mix i started the idea of the tiling business in about 2011 um i had bought a wet farm that was oh i sure. moved from my parents had beautiful dirt where they were at. And yep. I and you thought a, it was all like that. Yeah. It was good land, <laughs> but it was wet. Um, and uh, so I was like, I kept, 
don't know if you remember back when, when they did the TV signal switch where you had to buy like the little box so your TV would work again, yes. or you had to go to Dish Network. This was back in like the mid 2000s, right? Um, I was milking three times a day by myself. Like I didn't watch TV hardly at all. And, and when that happened, I was like, well, I just give up on TV. And I would just, I read a lot. I love to read. Yep. And you'd get all the farm magazines they'd send them to you and you'd read about tile all like in successful farming and you're like that's what i need yep that's what i need so that got my you know thoughts going and then you get to like ohio um where everything was tiled yeah. where we we're out in ohio with the semi and you're like you look at these tile outlets running everywhere and you're like gosh you could have that tile running constantly all the time yep. and i was like well i think i can do this yep and so what was your first you did you buy an existing somebody's business where you just bought everything or did no. you just go buy a so did you buy a plow or did you yeah. buy a plow for a for a tractor tractor plow tractor mounted yep so i had a, a 4455 and a 4450 two wheel drive and i got rid of both of those and i bought an 8200 with front wheel assist because okay i was looking at a couple of these tractor plows yep and they had uh um they showed like an 8000 like a bigger front wheel assist pulling them yep and I'm like, oh, well, that, they should be able to do it, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, then if I bought like an 8,000, I could still do all my field work with it. it it'd yep. be capable of doing everything. And and it worked, <laughs> but it didn't. If you were going to tile for everybody, and original thinking was, I mean, I don't think it'll become a business, but I'll do enough yeah. for everybody else that I can kind of do my yeah. own. Yeah. And Do it for everybody else and then do your own for free, kind of. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then everybody's like, hey, can you put some tile on for me? Yep. And so I'm, it turned into a business, kind of. Yeah. And yeah. then I bought like an 8960 with triples and diff lock. And I put a three point. I found one with a three point, which is pretty yep. rare. Yep. And ran that for another, I don't know, four years or something like that. And then it was like, I remember we had one tile job that was just a nightmare. I mean, this, this ground should have been just given back. Like Mother <laughs> yep. Nature wins that one. Just give it away. Yep. Left. Yep. Let it go fallow. But nope, this guy was bound and determined, and I was so pissed off. Like, just, we got the mini excavator stuck in this place, and I'm just like, holy cow. I don't know what I'm going to do here, and um, got talking to a guy, and I'm like, all right, if I had a commercial tile plot, I mean, these things, I mean, I'm sure they can do a lot, yeah. but I mean, they wouldn't be able to. He's like, oh, yeah, and I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I didn't want to keep trucking all the time because by then I had had kids yeah mm -hmm. and i'm like i gotta get out of the truck anyways so i'm like i guess we're jumping in and mm -hmm. bought a commercial tile plow and so do you don't so what like what are you all what what all are you doing now like what are you still trucking I'm still doing it all are you still not, doing all of it because you, so you jumped into cat dairy cows and are you out of that now do you have any oh the cows left in 2008 okay i was 30 years old and that's, okay that's when i got back into trucks okay the trucks came back in when i got i'm like yep okay so then uh, I still do a little trucking in the winter. Um, you know, just if you're not making money, you are spending money. Yeah. Yep. Like, so it'd yep. be very bad all winter long if you had nothing to do. Yeah. Like, so, and we need the money. I spent way too much money. We, you know, ended up buying a lot of land along yep. the way yeah. and reinvesting. And so do you, have you got, so you've got the farm to a point where that's kind of your main focus. Yeah. Tiling and you truck in the winter. Yep. And those are kind of your three things that you're focused yep. on. Cool. Yep. So you kind of, are, well, are you happy with the decision you made of not going down that road of doing the whole truck or what, what would we call mechanics. it? Mechanic, truck mechanics. Oh, and yeah. 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 Well, funny story. So I'm working this good union job and I'm like 22 at the time or something. And they said, hey, there's a meeting up in the break room you need to go to. It was for... Uh, retirement. It was for a retirement fund. So I was a teamster. Oh, yeah. And they're like, so we've got to figure out where you're going to invest your retirement because they were changing something with our retirement. So you had to pick your plan or whatever. And I'm up there and blah, 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 listening to it all, you know, and I'm walking down out of the, the meeting or whatever. And there was this old mechanic that I worked with who walked with his, his, his knuckles were curled up. His back was kind of hunched, you know, and he, he walked like this yep. and he looks at me and he says, he says, you got her made. And I go, really? And he says, yeah, you got her made. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, in 30 years, he goes, you'll be retiring a multimillionaire with this retirement plan they had. Yep. 
And I looked at him and I go, well, not in 30 years. I go, because I'm only 22. And they said that you still have to go to 55. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, but still. And I watched him walk away with all like, just like twisted up and that, working on concrete all those years. And he right was like 54. Went, That's not me. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that. Nope. Yep. Yeah. So I'm like, we need to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Yeah. You know, and. Yeah, I, I just, I was just sitting here thinking, I, I think a lot of people, they feel the pressure of, I mean, your parents pretty much didn't want you to farm and like inf- kind of influence you not to go down that route. And for you to be like, you know what? Screw it. I'm doing it no matter what. I mean, not everybody's bold enough to do that. So I just wanted to know yeah, how you felt now that you went through all that. Well, your, your dad's just a little bit older than me, but I would say of the, the Gen X, we're both Gen X. I think the Gen X farmers are probably the smallest group of farmers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gen X is a smaller generation, but I think even disproportionate, yeah. there's less farmers because growing up through the 80s and stuff like that and farming was not lucrative, you were kind of chased away. Yep. Like people were told, don't do this. This is this is not a good idea. This yeah. is mm-hmm. You know, you think about just think about in our neighborhood how many guys are farming that are my age. Yeah, not very many. Not not a lot. I mean, it's usually a, a little older. Some that are your age or younger, but I mean, even younger too. That's getting rare too. Yeah, there's pretty few. Like younger, there's there's quite a few guys that are younger by like five years. Mm-hmm. But and our county is kind of skewed because. The hog deal was such a big deal. Basis too, yep. You know, when I was selling hog buildings, that was one of the biggest draws of that was you could, if you, if you were a guy and you had, you know, you had 400 acres or you had 800 acres or whatever, the grain farming was trash. Yep. But if you had the equity, you could throw up a couple of hog sheds you could bring your kid home, have him chore the pigs, plus pay him. He get paid something for doing it, and then you had him for the help. And at the end of seven years, you know, when we started selling these, are one hundred and forty bucks a pig space. And if you took, if you took a little bit out, you could still pay for him in seven years. Now you can't pay for him in twenty, but then you could. Yeah. So there were, you know, there was quite a few guys, little younger than me, that. Um, Around this area, a lot of hog buildings went up, which if we didn't have that, we would be much more representative of a lot of the ag community where you don't have that generation because they didn't have that opportunity. But, um, no, I just laugh about that because there's a lot of mothers of that generation (laughs) that, the you know, the dad, the dad probably was... Like, let's face it, every, every dad, every farmer has a, has a soft spot, no matter how, no matter what the dynamic is, yeah. because, you know, someday we're going to make a highlight reel of how we, how we can treat each other. Cause everybody comments on our, on our farm videos. And it's <laughs> like, Oh, it's so great to see you two working together. Sunshine and rainbows. You two got such a good relationship <laughs> and oh, it's just great. You know, which we do have a it's good relationship. 95% of the time. It's till pretty we awesome. don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hogs never bring out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Terrible emotions between yeah. people when they're yeah. Yeah. handling them. Right. But, but I think a lot, you know, I think every farmer in the back of his mind, you kind of have this, you kind of have this dream that it'd be great to be able to farm with your kids. Agree. But usually in that relationship, especially through the 80s, the wife, who chances are had to get a job off the farm to help yeah. subsidize the addiction or, you know, the farm, they were the ones that instilled in that kid, in, that, in those kids, you are not. You are going to school. You're going to get a job. Mm-hmm. You're going to have the opportunities because there's no opportunity here. Well, and you were sold that bill of goods in society that college was the yeah right predominant. It was, same it was going to solve yeah. all your problems. You were going to get an amazing job because you got yeah. the degree. And maybe it was like that back then, but now I feel like that's conversation starting to change a yeah. little bit more. But just one thing I thought was funny though is you go back. You go back a hundred years because I told you this. So my my uh, great grandmother, 
her daughters, they had two daughters, and she absolutely did not want them to be stuck on the farm. So she sent both of them to college. She sent them to secondary school to get their masters, like to be teachers. And the one, what'd she do? She met a professor, and then he came back and looked at the farm and was like, damn, this is pretty nice. This is what I'm going to do. And I don't have any idea, but my dad always said that he's pretty sure that that like broke my grandmother's heart when she realized that her daughter was going to make the same mistake that she did. So it's not, it's not unusual. I mean, it just, but I think it's just a, I think the eighties especially was a time where it was pretty bleak. There was not a lot of opportunity. And I think, you know, she was doing what she thought she was trying to save you a lot of pain. Yeah. I, and it's funny that you know there it seemed like there was no opportunity in the 80s but you know what the most successful farmers today yep were the guys that started yep in the 80s yep the guys that that paid the biggest price were the guys that started in the early 70s because mm-hmm. they paid top dollar for everything yep. and if they held on to it if they made it through yep they spent a couple yep. decades yep. fixing the problem the guys that came along in the 80s with no debt, yep. and were able to buy land for you know it was, started at the bottom. Yep. yep, it was pennies on the dollar. Yep. A lot of that land was cash flowing within. Mm-hmm. It cash flowed within a couple of years. Yep, yep. it turned. Yep, and those guys um, that were on that in that era are the ones that today got to be mega farms yep. because it it just it clicked. Yep. It, and they're like you said, the cash cropping wasn't very lucrative. It really wasn't. Um, but the guys that that did it and got into it and played the game, I mean, and let's face it, there's been a game to it. Yep. You have to know the programs. You have to, you know, et cetera. Had to roll your pick certificates. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, so. the guys that just knew how to do it all and, and crop insurance helped, yep. et cetera. They were set up for when the RFS kicked in. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, those guys took a jump that got so far ahead of everybody else. Yeah. That, so like around us, I'd say if, if a guy, the, the livestock thing paid the bills for decades till it didn't. And the guys that, that continued to focus on that and, you know, well, livestock is what we do, didn't do near as well as the guys that said, we're going to, just go to crops. Yep. We're just not going to continue to invest into the livestock part of it. Yep. Those guys today, I mean, are just yep. so far ahead of it. And and the guys back then that got into it, really, um, part of the reason that they're so successful is because they really wanted to farm. Yes. Right. Got to have passion. Yeah, because you would have looked. I mean, nobody, you know, and, and if you look at somebody's uh, high school yearbook from, you know, the mid 80s that says, I'm going to go be a farmer. Nobody thought that said was said nobody ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the guys that did are very successful. Yeah. So when you, you know, you grew up dairying yep. and then you had your own dairy cows. And I went through this, like, I think we did a whole episode about this that. When, when you got out of that, was, was that a sense of relief or what, did you have to work through, did you feel guilty about like that you'd failed given, getting rid of them or were you like, don't let the door slap you on the ass on the way out, Messi? I felt fairly good about it because um, it wasn't a forced sale. There was no, yeah. if I don't, do this, you know, the, the world's going to end. It right. was, I did it on my terms and I got a little help from God with yeah. that. I mean, like literally it was divine yeah. intervention to sell those cows when I did. And we got really good money Yeah, at the time when I sold those cows. So it was, timing was really good. Um, and I guess I, I kept heifers back, some of the younger heifers. And I thought, well, I'll raise them up. I still had some feed left. We'll get them bred. If I feel like I missed the cows, then you know I'll yeah. I'll be able to start your again. Hedge. Yep, and I sold those heifers bread for less money a year later than what I could have got for them as calves. Yep, that the market had had tanked. turned, and that 
cured me <laughs> of, yep. of wanting the livestock. Yep. And, and, but I didn't milk cows or like with the pigs because I had a passion for milking cows or oh, a passion sure. for hogs. It was, yeah. it was, I loved to farm. Yeah. And you just, you had, that was, li- the, you did livestock, yeah. right? That's, right. you know, and I'll say this, like growing up around people like that, that always had livestock, one of the worst attitudes that you can have is to be that, um, well, this world wouldn't, would starve if it weren't for oh, me yeah. out here doing chores every yep. single day. <laughs> the country doesn't, I mean, I had that mentality at yep. one time, you know, it's like, well, the country owes me. I'm putting, you Food know, I'm milking table. these cows. What would they do? <laughs> if I didn't milk cows, guess what? When I sold the cows, Actually, the milk price continued to go down because yeah. production just kept growing Getting on the better. bigger farms. So yep. you have to do it for you Yep. because um, nobody else really cared. And once you put that away, it's like, oh. Yeah. Got to get your ego out of it. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, but yeah, to me, the, the cash cropping seemed, you know, almost impossible. To, to full-time farm, it seemed like it was so hard yeah. to get to. You had to, to have something. Yeah, that it's like, well, I mean, because there were guys that the catch, we're close to the Mississippi River. So we always had a market, like yeah. get some areas, it's like, well, they didn't start growing soybeans until 25 years ago or whatever. Yeah. There was, I mean, there's always been guys that did cash crop, yeah. but it's like, well, to come up with the acreage base and to, and it wasn't that lucrative. I mean, actually some of the best money in raising crops was uh, milking cows and then filling your uh, high moisture corn and your corn silage silos and then collecting an LDP check. Sure. Yep. Because you were, you were getting paid yeah. for the feed you were raising. It was like, you know, yep. well, this is great. But but that 07, everything changed. RFS started to kick in, and then the um, $70 a barrel oil, and it's like, wow. Ch- yeah, well, it changed the whole. It changed everything. It did. Mm-hmm. It did. It really did. And if you were one of those guys, like I said, that had been farming along in there, when it turned, yep. well, what a spot you were in. Yeah. Because I can remember that was the first time. So we're being right next to Minnesota like that, um, that you really heard about. Like there were Minnesota guys that came over and they went door to door trying to rent land. Yep. Or they put ads in the paper, yep. you know, trying to rent this land. And I mean, that just never happened. Before. Right. Like you, you didn't rent land away from people. Yeah. And when everybody had livestock, there were some, a guy would retire. He'd have to go around and find somebody that wanted to rent his farm. Yeah. Because it's like, well, we got enough feed to feed them. Yeah, the- nobody's got time. Yeah. Because it was a time thing. Yep. It it was like, it, exactly. It was, if you had enough feed to feed the cows. Yeah. There was no reason to, to farm more. And you didn't have, it was all you could do to get everything done that you had to do. Yeah. So. That guy that you had on the, your most recent YouTube video talking about the 1206. Yep. Is that right? Yep. When you two were rattling off everything he did, when he was talking about when he had cattle and he didn't, what he didn't do silage, he cut haylage every day. Is oh, that right? Green chop. Green chop. Yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing, but basically he went out every day, whatever he needed to feed the cows, he chopped that much. Like, mm, yeah. Jeez. And I was just sitting there thinking about that and I was like, so you're milking these cows how many times a day and you're going out and you're chopping what you need to feed them then you among them everything there. else you're doing. And then you probably got a haul manure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, so that guy, when you go, when that farmer goes to him and says, hey, you want to rent my 200 acres or my yeah. 106? He's going to look at it and go, nope. Hell no. Well, <laughs> I ain't mm-hmm. got time. Especially when you just got done figuring out what your LDP is going to be. And you're like, so I'm going to run more corn that I don't, you know, if you didn't yeah. have a dryer. And you sure. have, you're like, so I'm going to haul this to the co op. Yep. Um, I might make something on the LDP, but Maybe. I might might not i might go backwards yep so it's like i'm good yeah i'm good yeah isn't that crazy yeah and then it just it just changed just like that yeah. like well there's margin you you had yeah. you were basically the way you survived was a low cost producer yep to there was actually margin that the more land you had the more money you made yeah. And it hadn't been that way. It hadn't been that way since the 70s. Right. And land rents jumped like double yeah. within months. 
Because oh. it was like when you first started hearing these rants, you're like, these guys are crazy. And this was 2007 that this happened? Uh, yeah, by yeah. 07, yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. I think the RFS kicked in, what, 405? Explain to people what that RFS is, because they might not know. Okay. Well, the re- renewable fuel standards where we started requiring... Blending you know, ethanol. Blending ethanol. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. And suddenly our demand for corn went Sky up rocket. significantly. So I don't know how many ethanol plants were built within a within a five year period. Oh yeah. It was a ton. Yep. It was a ton. And and then the other part of that is they were built in areas away from the rivers for the most part, not always, yep. where traditionally the basis had been terrible. Because yep. you had all that freight to get it to the river. And so that's where they build them. And then that thing opened and overnight where you had, you know, yesterday you had a forty five cent basis. Mm-hmm you had a zero basis or you had a positive basis. Yeah. So basically it's the equivalent of like we always talk about here, we're very hog lucky feeders. in the fact that we have all these hog feeders. Yep. So what our county is a corn deficit county to where we actually consume more corn than what we produce because we grind for so yep. many pigs. Well, you got the same thing around some of these ethanol plants. Oh, where, yeah. So it just was like you flipped a switch. And yeah. so the money became... It was like the gold rush of grain farming. Like everybody kind of made the switch like, okay, if I go all in on this, or if you were a little proactive before that yep. hit, you were set up in a great position oh. to really make, in, make some money. Yeah. So what, where we're at today, though, it ain't that way anymore. So what, <laughs> what, explain to people, you both can, and we can have a conversation. See, I was seven years old at that time. So, yep. you know, yep. I don't, I didn't live that, but... It's just interesting hearing it. But so like where we're at today, why isn't it that way anymore? What happened? Because the costs, the costs and yep. the prices, everything caught up. And that was that was highest corn prices we had. Now then we're our production is caught up and our yields have So we're meeting better. demand. We're plus meeting that demand. prices of just operating have gone yeah, up. Yeah, so your operating costs have gone up and your your top line prices have actually come down. I mean, here we are as we sit here today, what what's 440, 435, yeah. I don't know what it would be today. You know, we you know, those years there if you if you were decent with your marketing, I mean, corn there was a lot of $7 corn out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you got to remember that we're producing a commodity. So the idea of producing a, co- a commodity, the market doesn't want you to make a margin in a commodity. It will always go to the low-cost producer. And and what happens is, and this is why farming is such a, you know, it, it's not an in or out thing. Yeah. Like, you play it out a long time because, you know, people will say all the time, well, that won't cash flow. This won't ca- How can right. he afford that? Right. There's no way that'll work. And it's like, well, his cash flow and your cash flow are very different. And so the guy that was, you know, farming a thousand acres before the RFS, when everybody's like, well, there ain't no money in this, yeah. suddenly is now in this position where he's got this margin that's insane. Mm-hmm. And then he doubles down. Yeah. Right. And um, and that's where, so it kind of squeezed some people because even then I remember uh, a buddy of mine, his brother never really wanted anything to do with the farm suddenly took some interest yep. in the farm, wanted to be a farmer. Yep. And it's like, yep, that. So you, you've heard me say this. So during that time, during that period, 2008, I mean, clear up 2009, 2010. Thir- I'd say the 13. Yeah. I always say, you know when it's not going to last – when you pick up every farm magazine and there's some ag economist that has an article that's titled, we've hit a new plateau in the corn market and we're never going back. As yeah. soon as you read that, you say, honey, we better get the budget out. We better we better figure out how yeah. we can tighten her belts because it's, it's when everybody's singing the praises of how the world demand, you know, the world's yeah. got money, they're going to buy corn. The ethanol blending's just going to get, we're going to go E85 everywhere. This is, we're never going back. It's never going under $5 ever that, again. That's <laughs> when you know it's about to take, to take a shit. Well, yeah, and you're like, 
Well, that makes sense because I mean it's eight dollars right now. Yeah. So if it does drop to five, yeah, no we're... big deal, <laughs> yeah. no big deal. Yep. And that's why I always had a problem when they were like with the the argument against ethanol, where they're like the food versus fuel, and it's like, no, if you if you pay, like we could we could double the output, yeah, of America in corn production today if there's enough money in it. Yep. It's it's just yeah. pay the farmer. Yeah. And we'll overproduce. I mean, there's we will, no scenario where we won't be able to overproduce. Yeah. It could be $10 corn. Yep. And guys will be upside down. Yep. 100%. Because it's like, well, because everything adjusts. So I always said that, like, when I milk cows, I can remember in like the, the mid early 2000s and back the old farm bill, remember that conservation payment you yep. used to get in the spring? So as long as you were following the conservation program on your farm, there was a a, a payment, just a it'd trigger a payment. There was no yep. PLC, ARC, whatever the one that came after that where you had to pick your base acres yep. and all this. Um, and it was that. And then selling milk to a, a co-op, we would get a dividend check sure. um, every year. And between the dividend check and that conservation payment, that pay for my inputs yep. to put in a crop, you know, to, to feed the cows, to feed my dairy cows. Yep. And it's like, Oh, so it was Pretty no big deal. deal. <laughs> and now the inputs are like, cause I was talking to a neighbor in like 2021 when things started to come up again. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, here we go again. It's going to be just like in 2012 when everybody and their brother suddenly wanted to start farming. Yeah. And he goes, I think it's different this time because in 2012, if you wanted to farm 80 acres, like you could go to, you know, farm credit and get a $25,000 operating note and, and, and you're golden. Yep. You're going to get your 80 acres in and, you know, and everything's fine. Now the price of admission is so high. You and I just talked about this, about seed corn. Yeah. You know, I, my dad about had a coronary the first time corn went over a hundred dollars a bag. It hasn't been that long ago. No. And now now it's like it's going to cost you four hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean it's insane. It, so that's that's the thing is, you know that those numbers came up, and when they came up, every one of these, every one of these <sighs> genetics companies, chemical companies, machinery companies that had been plugging away through all that time, just like the farmers. Yeah, they all said. Time to double down. Yeah, Time just like to double the farmers. down. And it's like these implement dealers. Do you remember there, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010? You walk into your local John Deere dealer. I mean, they had they had the precision planning guy. They had they yeah. had a guy for everything. Oh, yeah. Like they were knocking out walls to make more cubicles for all the freaking people they had. Now you go in there and there's a lot of empty space because they don't need all those guys because now we've swung back the other way. There was a frenzy of involvement in agriculture. And um, and once again, like I said, with farming, it's you have to be committed yeah. to farm. You know, like you're not going to make money now, but right. you will at make some money. point that happened on the supplier side. Because look at Bayer yep. looking at Monsanto going, oh, my gosh, this is a the, Slam the, dunk. Yeah, the goose that lays the golden egg. Monsanto. What could go wrong? And the the board at Monsanto was like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Here, <laughs> knock yourselves out. Yep. And they, you know, they they jumped in quick. We're gonna get into this, and and Bear got burned. Oh, bad. Hard. Like you couldn't. They couldn't have timed that any worse, really, than what they did. No. I mean, it was like. Yeah, it was bad. So the prices we see today, do you feel like part of it, do you think it's a little bit of both of inflation of just the dollar? But do you also feel like there's companies out there that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, these companies, they're just raising prices because, you know, they know they can and they know inflation's kind of the thing that's just floating around and people are I don't know. People are thinking, oh, it's just inflation. It's just inflation. Do you feel like these companies are inflating their prices internally and with inflation? Like I, with the prices that we're seeing today? Or do you think it's just straight inflation from well, the government? On equipment. It's supply and demand. Yeah. It, it, 
look at what the equipment business is, is every bit as tough as farming, I think, because everything that you, every, their raw materials have gone up. I don't know what, but their labor, their labor has gone up incredibly. Oh, yeah. The cost of technology. And, and the thing is the cost of staying, the cost of keeping up with the Joneses, because every company out there is looking for an edge. Yeah. And, and to some degree, farmers, we've kind of, we've kind of bought this, this, this bill of goods that somehow this technology is going to make, like, it's going to make, it's going to make us money. We got to have this. Right. It's going to save labor. It's going to save time. It's going to give us better yield. And so we've all hopped on this train that we got to have all this stuff. So as a result, all these machinery companies and all these equipment companies, they're chasing that next thing. And it's just a, the result is our equipment prices are just gone. Crazy. Well, and the demand for that equipment. I mean, you remember as a kid when somebody bought a brand new tractor in oh, the area, yeah. you were like, holy smokes. Yeah. How, how did that guy ever afford a new tractor? Yeah. And now... I mean, like I can remember in like 2012, like everybody bought a new tractor and you're like, yeah. How? But what the other thing that changed there in that time frame was, you know, when we grew up, you bought a track, you bought a new tractor or a new to you tractor. Yep. And you, that it was that, like, just like we were just talking about for, for your bit, the tractor never left. Right. But then when all that, when that profitability came, the idea of trading. So when I was a kid, there was a few farmers. There was like, in our neighborhood, there was like one guy you knew that he was the only child. His dad died when he was young and yep. he inherited 800 acres. And he'd run, he'd run a combine three or four years and they'd trade it. Yep. And you're like, boy, that'd be nice, you know. You're sitting here. We're sitting here with a Massey 850 spinning the bearing that when you call the shop, they're like, oh, that bearing should never go out. Because you're like, how do you get to this bearing? And they go, well, uh, that, that bearing should never go out. That was a bad, <laughs> that's a bad call. But anyway, you know, they're, get, they're trading equipment. And nobody else is trading equipment. Right. And then when that deal started, you saw these guys. Interest was the cheap. Interest was cheap. Oh, Absolutely. And you saw these guys that were growing and leasing equipment that really got started and then rolling it. Like it was, there were guys that would buy a combine and set it up for annual payments. Yep. And at the end of the, the term, they traded the combine. Right. And they, they were just playing that. They were just rolling it and rolling it and rolling. There was guys that were trading tractors every year or trading every two years anyway. Yeah. And you could make it work because there was somebody lined up that they wanted to buy a two-year-old combine and they were trading theirs yep. four years. And then the very bottom of it got shipped to South America or wherever. But, right. But that all worked because it was a time of – Prices just kept going up and income kept going up. Yeah, when it when it got really hot, um, these these dealers, I mean, it was well, machinery Pete would talk on on the radio show, like on AgriTalk or something, be like, it's not a matter of finding the right one, it's finding one. Yeah. So it was like your dealer would call you and you'd said, you know, well, I'm looking for a, you know, an eighty one hundred. Yeah. And he'd go, Well, I have an eighty one hundred, and you'd say, Okay, I'll take it. It wasn't yeah, you know, you didn't have it? time to look at it because yep. if he hung up the phone with you, it was gone. Because yep. the next guy's like, "Yep, I'll take it." So in Deer and Case IH and everybody else is just like, "Well, let's just tack on another twenty percent this year. Let's yep. just keep tacking it on until we see where the market is. Yeah, mm. where and, the demand is. Yep. And unfortunately, that that is catching up. Yeah. Now, now it, now it has finally. And it and it some of these guys, you know, there was the. Those guys that were rolling equipment all the time, the lease don't grease guys. Yes. When things tighten up in like 14, I remember some of those guys being like, oh, we didn't take care of this thing and now we're, we're stuck. stuck. Yeah, 100%. You know, so um, 
but the thing is now like we're all so well equipped where so if you didn't buy a single piece of equipment for five years you'll be fine you'll be fine where back years ago when everything was held together with like you had to buy a piece of equipment a year yeah because everything was junk yeah because you kept everything so it was pretty much a deal where when you when you when the planter needed traded it is because it was shot yeah because basically it's like i can't weld on that frame anymore <laughs> yeah yeah when we call in your you know your when you're getting your new planner lined up or new to you planner yeah. lined up you're like well what's mine worth on trade and the guy's like hold on let me call what's it weigh yeah okay <laughs> you yep. know that's, yep i mean because it was it that's was a, just playing shot it was and new equipment was you know was rare it right. was it was rare to get yeah. Like people ran everything until it was shot. And yeah. now, I mean, look at all the consolidation in the the machinery dealers yeah. that, I mean, I mean, cause how many different dealerships were there? I bet today versus 30 years ago, there's 5% of oh, the easily. dealers in the state of Iowa. Yeah. We talked about that. You know, our little town, there was a John Deere dealer. There was an AC dealer, four Nashes. They're big tractor pullers. They, uh, yeah. They ran the Allison. They had an AC and they had an Allison. What was that? A V12? Probably. In it. Yeah. That was a screaming machine. But they, we had a pretty, we had a pretty big, we had a pretty good sized AC dealership down here. So, watch what you say about the AC guys. I'll be careful. Yeah. <laughs> be careful. Anyway, and we had an IH dealer and we had a, uh, we had a uh, case, case Gale. Massey. Oh, we had a Massey dealer and then we had a case store in Kelowna. Yep. I mean, we had all of that. Yep. And uh out of all that, we have a John Deere dealer. And that one John Deere dealer owns how many stores? Twelve stores now. Yeah. So I I'll always say that, you know, the of all of the plays going through the eighties, John Deere would not be where they are today if it wasn't for the fact they made a, ca a calculated effort to keep their dealers going and it paid them because there was nobody left. Yeah. I mean, that is probably more than anything else. I think the reason why they were, they've become who they are is because there was a time in there where. That was the only do? brand you saw. Well, it, it's like, if you're going to go buy something, here's your decision. I'm going to go. 10 miles, or in our case, I'm going to go four miles. Yep. Or I'm going to drive 35 or 40 miles. Right. And then you had no, you know, if it was Agco, well, who knows whether they're going to be in business next year or not. So. Yeah, Deer had just their availability. And, and Deer in the 80s, the smart play, because I yeah. always laugh, because you'll get people in the comments, you know, that'll talk like on a tractor video or something. They'll be like, well, you know, John Deere just about went broke in the eighties, you know, just like the rest of them. And it's like, no, they didn't, but they, they didn't. actually, they actually <laughs> turned a profit yeah. throughout the eighties. There's only like two years ever deer didn't turn a profit. And it's like, well, people say, well, they kept the sound guard cab too long. And it's like, well, th yeah, they weren't, they weren't going they to weren't innovating. Some, yeah. They weren't going to do that in that time frame because there was no profit margin. Yeah. It, I, I don't know what the numbers would be, but I'd be curious to know, like, through through there's a five year period in there compared to before and after, like what what their sales number of units. So I can't remember somewhere I've got it, I think I had it saved somewhere, but I think it was it was eighty five or eighty six. There was like a, a farm equipment uh um association that did or or some or it might have been Wall Street Journal talking about the different manufacturers. And I want to say that at one point, I think at the worst of it, I want to say it was the market had shrunk by two thirds. Yeah. So at one point, you know, when things were at the peak, so from the peak to the valley, yeah. it was something like the market shrunk by two thirds. So they had a pie graph showing, you know, like Deer's market share versus everybody else. Yeah. At the valley, Deer could have supplied the entire market. Sure. Oh, you yeah. wouldn't need the production of any Anybody other else. farm equipment manufacturer. Yeah, That's wow. how bad it got. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine, um, his dad, uh, we're, we're probably like 16 and we we're out in the yard as a summer night. And we we're just BSing. after we'd all got done milking cows or whatever. 
and we're looking around and you know he had a New Holland, uh, New Holland blower, New Holland chopper, the New Holland haybine was sitting over there. And I, I don't remember what his chopper boxes were or something, but he looked at us and he said, do you guys know, see that, see the, the haybine over there, see the blower, see the chopper boxes, see the chopper. He says, everything about the tractors there basically. He says, see all that? Oh well, yeah. He said, I bought that all in 1979. He says, you know, and now this is like the mid nineties and he goes, yep. I haven't replaced it yep. since, but that, but if you look like the late seventies, yep. boom time. And these guys were just, and I'm going to try and get them on a video one of these days, but one of the, an old farmer was telling me one time in our area, he bought his farm in like 70, 76, 74, 75. And he, he's at the bank. They just got done closing on the farm and the banker does one of these, like he leans out, going to pull, pulls the curtains. He goes, is that your pickup out there? He says, yeah. He says, that's not you probably need a new pickup, don't you? If you're going to be a farmer. Like, your banker telling you you should probably get Go a new spend pickup. spend some more money. Like, my banker was never like, you nope. should spend some money. No. Nope. <laughs> yep. So you guys talked about equipment and why equipment prices have gone up the way that, you know, they've gone up. Now they're coming down a little bit, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Okay. Especially auction. You, so what you about know. seed? What about chemicals? Is that same thing? Supply and demand, less farmers? I think that more than the equipment is the the investment these guys made in technology, and now they're like, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, to me, it just seems like speculate. Just if you don't know, what what do you think? Like what? I, do you well, I think on the chemical end of it, um, they've finally gotten kind of pushed into a a predicament because there's enough um, generics. Generics have taken over. Yeah. Big time, and there's, 100%. like, you don't have to go buy a chemical at the co-op anymore. There's independence. There's, you know, you name it. Cash and carry. Yep. So yeah. I think they have to become more lucrative than that. And then the seed end of it, um, there's some pushback. Because Roundup Ready technology was a plague on the seed industry. Yeah. Because prior to Roundup Ready, like, I mean, think about how many seed companies when you're a kid. Yep. Like, I mean, it was, it was crazy. The amount of seed companies roundup ready comes along and it's like, you either got to pay Monsanto or you're not going to sell any seeds. So right. a lot of those seed companies kind of got out. Yep. Um, it was bad for competition. Well, a few of them stayed in and then Monsanto just went on a spree where they just bought everybody. Same well, when they pump. bought Holden's, yeah. I mean, when they bought Holden's, they, that screwed a bunch of people because there were so many independent guys got their germ from Holden's. Yep. And then Monsanto stepped in and went. Yep. So you had all this controlled and now um, Roundup doesn't do shit anymore. You know, and no. even like a, even like a, a, you can have a triple pro. Yeah. Well, they go, well, you're going to have to either use insecticide or you're going to have to go to a smart stacks yeah. or whatever. So I think the effects of that technology is worn off enough that there's still a few independent seed companies. I got a lap, so I have a DeKalb hat on right now. I've only planted DeKalb like one year ever. But they make a good hat. Well, I was at a farm show, <laughs> and DeKalb was giving out hats, and I was like, that is a really nice hat. <laughs> and um, so yeah. I, I plant uh, the Wisconsin State Monsanto brand. It be Young's or Jung's. Yeah. I plant some of that, and I plant... Uh, Frontiersman, which they are an independent. Yeah, that was uh, his brother's original Funks G. Oh yeah, sure. Funks G. Uh, Crows, which became Channel, Supercrossed. Yep, in Midwest, those were all like Funk family members. Yep. This Frontiersman, this is Dick Funk. He stayed independent. His brother sold out to Montana over the yeah. years, and uh, he stayed independent. Well, a buddy of mine started um, selling for him, and. If you can find an independent, if you're willing to plant non-GMO corn, yeah. like, so if you go to your DeKalb dealer and you say, I want some non-GMO corn, they're going to be like, well, it's only 10 bucks a bag cheaper than the, right. the Roundup Ready or whatever. An independent, they don't have to pay Monsanto. The, right. Then it's like, oh, they'll cut you a deal. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I think people are working around that. And there's, there's, there was just as much investment on the input and as there was the farmers investing into this mm -hmm. and just like the farmers aren't going to quit farming 
you know, prices are down. Now these guys have to. They got to play ball. Yeah, because, yeah, you might, the co-op might be like, we're we're married to this, you know, yep. this contract we have on this chemical. And they're like, so, yeah, if you want this chemical, it's, it's you know, 20 bucks an acre and this independence, like, well, I'll sell it to you for 10. Yeah. You're going to go with that. Do you think that's, well, I think it all plays together, but. How close do you think we are to some of these big, somebody like Bear? I don't mean to just pick on them by themselves, but their shoulders are broad so they can take it. So to this idea that they want to build the model where they want to sell their product, they want to yeah. sell their seed, and they want to sell their chemical, and them going to these guys that want to farm a gazillion acres – and saying, okay, we'll supply all your inputs and you go rent the ground and we don't give a shit what you have to rent it for, we'll guarantee you so much an acre and you can sell the crop through us, we'll market it for you, and when it's all said and done, we'll guarantee you this much profit. One, do you think that that is going to come to fruition? And two, do you think that that has any chance of like really growing because I've thought about that and because I there's some guys out there that well we know there's guys that will get big just for the sake if, of if getting I can big. run if I can run all new equipment and I get my seed corn trip to Hawaii and I get my my if I get my winter trip, my summer trip, I can be the big cock swinging son of a bitch. Yep. I'll sell my soul for it. Right. There is, there is that. The beauty of it is, um, and we take it for granted, we cuss them like crazy when it goes the wrong way. But the Chicago Board of Trade is a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. And that's been one of the few things. So, like, we've talked about, like, uh, Back years ago, like in the in the forties, the a lot of times a, a a farm wife would sell eggs. That's where her money came from was selling eggs. Yeah. Like there hasn't been an independent small egg market, you know, other than somebody just selling, you know, the neighbors right. here will sell eggs. But like chickens, poultry, and that went to the big model. They were the first verdict totally vertically yep. integrated yep. animal. And then hogs. I mean, how many guys were independent hog producers? Yeah, back years ago, it was everybody Pharaoh to finish, and you're like, well, what could be better than that? You got a guy's Pharaoh in his own grower, the yep. nursery, you know, and then to finishing, can't beat that. They got the hogs, never go away. Yep, yep. the '90s took care of that. Yep, and then we always said in the dairy, we're like, well, in dairy, how are they ever going to get the dairy? Because you could have one guy who take care of 50 cows. He has everything he needs on that farm and does all yep. the work. He's himself. a low cost producer. Yep, doesn't get any better than that. Well, they got the dairy. The only thing that's kept them from getting the grain is because, let's just say, say Bear is doing that. So they've got, let's just say they have 15% of the acres in the United States are under the control of Bear. And they're playing games with the market. Well, the market can make it hurt. Yes, it can. So Ask Bungie. They tried it. Yep. That has broke Verisun. Yep. I mean, there's been a lot of people that thought they were really, really big and could throw yep. their weight around. And, I mean, there's funds that have lost everything yep. trying to short something or going long at the wrong time. Yep. So the the Chicago Board of Trade is good because it, it, it will find a market. So I think yep. it'll, it'll hurt some of them guys. And yep. eventually what will happen is things will adjust down the new normal – will hit farming won't be lucrative yep and then a company like bear or somebody's like it's gonna go is this worth porn yeah because it's so because think of the capital that they're tying up for a margin and the the other thing about it is they're not cargill no they answer to a board they and they're a corporate and they want their 15 percent to the bottom or 30 Yep. They want their margin. And if you can't get it's like you can do that for a while. Yeah. But at some point they go, okay, no, we're not, you know, get the hell out of that. So you don't think it'll last if it happens. Do you think it will happen though? 
I think they'll try. I think somebody's yeah. going to try. I guarantee you they will. Yeah. Because the idea is if you can eliminate if you can eliminate enough of the variables and you can generate they're figuring that they're going to generate their profit off their products and everything else that's just the cost of doing business. Yeah. And but it'll be you're right. The problem is they can't control enough of it long enough. They can't withstand if somebody bets against them. So say Smithfield is is a company that's involved in growing the pigs, yep. Farrow to finish on the pigs, but then they're not just selling the pigs on the open market. Right. Smithfield is selling a finished product in a store. Right. Okay, and that so makes sense now because I was kind of thinking, yeah, okay. I was like, We're, so how is that different? But no, that's that's how that's it's how it's different. So they're corn getting, is just corn. Right. They're yeah. not getting a premium they're not, to a grocery. Yeah, they're not selling it to a grocery store and getting a premium right. on the product. And that's why commodity markets work the way they do is a bushel of corn from me is no different than a bushel of mm -hmm. corn from you as long as it makes green. Right. Right. And that's why the the value added stuff is is, is important in the long run if you're yeah. you know in the small farm you'll you'll need probably to do more of that. But I, I I've said it before, I'll say it, we've talked about this that people always say the small farm's coming back. It's not. The small farm isn't going away. Right. But like the small farm, you know, we're small farmers. We're about the same right. size. Right. Yeah. You know, we could be big farmers if we had a time machine and just could go back yeah. a couple of decades, three decades. It'd be like, oh, yeah. Like yeah. as a kid. I will. I will rent that. I will buy that. Yeah. Well, and and um, my if I could transport my farm back 30 years ago, I'd have been a big farmer. Yeah. Yeah. Hunter. Yeah, you would have been. But today it's like, so you're a small farm where 30 years ago you were a big, big farm. Right. It'll happen. So now, you know, in, in 10 years from now, that thousand acre guy is, is really small. Yeah. You know, the, that's where it's going to go. You're going to have your people that have, you know, a few animals, um, you know, do some specialty crops and that kind of stuff. But when it comes down to corn and beans and wheat and the commodities that the world needs, it bigger, it's going to keep going. It's gotta, yep. It just keeps going up. Yep. Hey, guys, if you're a livestock producer, you've got manure. Our partner has your solution. Livestock, water, and energy creates clean, recyclable water, carbon credits, and two solid byproducts, fertilizer and the salts, from processing manure in real time. They clean the manure, and we get clean, recyclable water back to the barn clean as a whistle. This process creates additional revenue streams for the livestock producer that they didn't have before. These guys are putting something together and it's starting to smell like opportunity. Give them a shout at livestockwaterandenergy.com and watch our journey with them. We've partnered with these guys. Check out our YouTube channel, This'll Do Farm, and follow the journey there. Now let's get back to it. So yeah, what do you, I, just to finish this off, then we'll get into something different, but what do you think is the, we do a lot, we're doing a lot of speculating on this, this one, but what do you what think's the new, best. what do you think will be the gold rush? What's the next gold rush? You know, you talked about 2007, ethanol came and that, yep. that brought everything up. So, and you talk about how the, you go in farming, you have these long spurts where somebody's doing something that. Every, all the neighbors are looking at them like, why do, they got, why do they got all that land? And then they hit, something hits and they go. What do you think is that coming up? If you had to guess what that would be. I think it's cycles. I think it's cycles. I, yeah. I really thought something that, that I just am really surprised about is when I saw the Russian invasion of Ukraine... I thought that by now we would see commodity prices start to move because Russia's, Russia and Ukraine are the two biggest producers of wheat in the world. Yep. And Ukraine's ag sector has got to be just absolutely decimated. Like, where is all of this wheat going to come from? Because it's not coming from there because... There's nobody farming that ground. Those guys are all in a trench with a gun pointed at some Russian somewhere. 
You know what I mean? Their production hasn't dropped. I and that's that what I much. can't figure out. Could you say setup? I don't. Well, you, you know, we need to get a roll of Reynolds wrap. <laughs> we always talk about our tin yeah. foil, and then we never have it. <laughs> I know. We need to get. We need to just have here, hats. We need to have <laughs> tin foil hats right here that we could just reach for and put I, on. I yeah, because there's a lot of things you don't. Know, so. You'd read online last year, you know, when when the crop prices were dropping. Yeah. You know, and you're like, they kept saying that the reason, because the weather we were having looked like we were going to have a short crop. Yeah. Um, but the price wasn't going up. And then they, they kept saying, well, there's no demand. There's no demand. Um, as it turns out, like, uh, I think our exports ended up being fairly yeah. strong. Yeah. So the system's rigged. Yeah. To a certain extent. I mean, and and just like with the, um, I remember in 2019 being just beyond pissed when it's the big prevent plant year, and you're like, there's no way we're going to get these kind of yields. Yes. There's, there's zero chance. Because a wetter year is always worse than a drier year. Yes. And what they say this year when they did the August WASD was the final adjustment in the crop down. They're the quarterly stocks. It was the final adjustment from the 2019 crop. And it's yeah. like, so there they go. They manipulated that market and trickled it along and trickled it along. Yeah. And and uh, so they're, they're obviously, you know, because if we're a wash in grain, like they said we were, why aren't we seeing two dollar corn? Yeah, right. But it's they're keeping it here because yeah. it's not lucratively profitable, but it's also not devastatingly yeah. negative. You, you'll adjust. Yeah. You'll yeah. the The other thing about that. So to your point, I do think that at some point we're going to get. They're not at some point they're going to get caught to where. We do have demand, and we don't have crop, and we are going to have another run-up in prices. Oh, I just don't know how long that's going to be. But something that the other part of that whole Russian thing and and the whole, you know, we're pulling back from global markets. There's all this talk about how, you know, it's not going to be a world, it's not going to be a world economy anymore because, People have gotten burned in China, and we're bringing manufacturing back to the United States. And Europe is running out of people. Like the age deal is killing them. The age deal is killing the Chinese. But fertilizer, so much fertilizer comes from China and comes from overseas. And like South America, they have built this. They have built this machine, and they haven't got dirt. Like you go to South America where they're raising these crops, it's like fucking beach sand. Yeah, it's but not, they pour a shitload. Of, it yeah. takes a shitload of fertilizer. I think and gypsum, right? Like they need gypsum because yeah. their pH is just terrible. Yeah, and they get all of it from Russia and China. So when this all happened, when this was all going on, I was like, okay, so the cost to get their fertilizer to them is going to go up exponentially. And wheat production is going to go in the shitter. So crop prices ought to just hammer. And it has not played out anywhere like I thought it was going to. No. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? So I don't know. I, I have no idea. But I do think that as the world becomes more uncertain, the chances to have big swings in crop prices, I think I, I think there's a good year out there. But by the same token, I think you're gonna see more volatility both ways. Absolutely. And and I don't think we carry um the stocks. No. That we so like in the eighties, like I think I can't remember if it was the eighty two or eighty three, it was like with the pick years. Yeah. At one point in the US, no kidding, we had one hundred percent carry out. There's like a full wheat. year's crop. Yep. You could just, bins. you just didn't have to grow wheat and everything. Everybody could continue to eat the same way they did. Jeez. So we don't have that. No. Today and, no. and worldwide, they don't. Right. So, and like the whole South American thing, um, it still has to make sense economically. Yeah. So, like, because the cost of production, like they're saying, Brazilian corn production isn't going to be phenomenal. 
because it doesn't pay. Right. Like when when corn's six bucks here, they're like, we'll grow corn. Absolutely. Four dollar corn, they're like, it isn't worth it. No. And I don't think because I say this all the time, like there's nowhere in the world I think that you could move to and farming is lucrative. So like central no. Illinois, farmland's crazy expensive, but they get crazy yields and crazy good basis. Right. So you're like, well, it's too expensive there. I'm going to move to Oklahoma. And it's like, well, yeah, well, their yields are terrible. The weather is hit and miss or, or like. And you got to put it on a rail car to get it anywhere. Right. So it's like it, it all, it's a commodity. It's, yep. you know. It's it, like the hog market. I mean, we've said for the reason we raise pigs here is because there's nowhere in the world that you can produce a pound of pork as cheap as you can produce it in Southeast Iowa. That's why it's here. Yeah. I mean, it just is. And doesn't mean it's always profitable, but still cheaper than anywhere else. So, yeah. And this, and once you build the machine, it has to run. Right. Cause you can't, you're like, we can't operate at a loss. And it's like, well, you can't make the payments if you're not operating. Right. So, mm-hmm. a lot of that, you know, goes on. But yes. And the other thing with the volatility is so we've added acres around the world. So, even in the United States, like when we grew record acres, like yeah. we had the record last year wasn't quite a record but it was close yep. like what 12 might have been the record yeah but it's like so those acres that we added in that time frame they weren't in southwestern minnesota northwestern iowa central illinois it was north dakota yeah it it was south dakota areas that weren't yeah. typical I, I ran into a guy i went to the i went to the commodity classic in orlando last year and I ran it. I sat down and was eating lunch, and I ate lunch with this family from uh, Eastern Colorado. And they were there. They were getting the the state yield dry land yield uh, certificate from Pioneer. They set the record for the dry land yield in Colorado that year. And it was what did I tell you? It's like fifty four bushel or something like that. Sixty sixty bushel yeah. maybe. I was like, damn. Why'd you do that? But they're, you know, the, re- the only reason they had is because they, all their shit was irrigated. But at that time, they weren't getting any water because that was during the oh. time of all the drought. So they got cut off. So yep. they planted everything. It was dry land. And that was, they got the record yield that year. But anyway, <laughs> holy shit, we've gone over an hour. We haven't even talked about <laughs> I, how it is that you and I and us, how we, how you're here. Cause we didn't read about you on the uh, classifieds. <laughs> we kind of met. On yeah. social media. Yeah. So how the hell, how did that start? Fell into it, Yeah, I guess. Yeah, um, tell people what you do before. So I just talk randomly about agriculture, very similar to like you guys do. Mm-hmm. Um, on started on TikTok. Uh, talking about, especially tractors, is something I love to do and really enjoy doing. So then that kind of started to bleed over now and uh, just this last year uh youtube stuff with actually talking about guys about tractors you know mm-hmm. and uh that's really important yeah to me especially the older farmers getting this history mm-hmm. before it's gone right no that's that's huge i mean we don't, I don't think young people we're not we're, we're not good at looking back at the history i don't think and like You got to have people like for me, like just even this podcast, you know, what you guys were talking about, the swings and the market in 2007, like, you know, I was a kid. I didn't live that, you know, just even that alone, that's important. And I've watched your videos and like, I'm not a huge equipment guy just because we're not, we're not in a position on our farm to really look at buying new equipment. And I just haven't like educated myself enough but I still would love just getting that history is seeing, you know, an old farmer tell the story about, you know, his tractor and his equipment. It's awesome. Well, and in your farming career, you'll see something and you'll think, well, this is unique mm-hmm. to this era. This, what, this has never happened. Nobody's dealt with this before. And it's like, yeah, they did. Mm-hmm. This, this generation did deal with this and, and knows all about it. So don't worry about it. You know, so if you don't pay attention to the, that history, well, we always say, I mean, those that don't heed history, you know, are bound to repeat it, right? Mm-hmm. And and there's a lot of lessons in there. And I, 
part of it, you get a little older and you realize that, uh, gosh, this, this thing is, uh, changing mm-hmm. on me and, and looking forward, you, you hate to see agriculture going the way it is. It's, it's sad because, because it is something like I said, you, you have to be passionate, very passionate about agriculture if you're going to do it. And you had all these people that were very passionate about it. Now this group is is this small, and it's it's heading to this small. Yeah. And as it's getting smaller and smaller, you got these people that are all really passionate about it, and they're either going to really get along because and share that camaraderie, or they're going to really butt heads because they're all in competition. And I, I think we need to pay a little bit more attention to the history of it and. Yeah. You know. Well, that's cool that you're doing that. I I commend you for doing that because I I think you're right. That's that's awesome. And so you mostly talk. So, like, what kind of just for if somebody has never checked out your channel or your TikTok, what if you had to break it up? What mostly is your content like? Talking old farmers about their tractors. You just talking about history. Like, what what's the mix of it all? Uh, I'd say a lot of history. A lot of just about equipment yep um you know comparing a lot of comparing Mm -hmm. stuff criticizing alice chalmers is a significant portion (laughs) did you and tony reed get together and just decide that you wanted to just crush the spirit of the ac gleaner people or was that was just totally haphazard but so this is how the alice thing with me started was i did a video talking about um, it was fairly early on, really early on, and I had said something about 4020s and 806s were like the backbones of farms. Like they literally built somebody's farm. Yeah. And that, you know, that they were, and, and those tractors were phenomenally, you know, reliable. And the and the fact that they were the tractor that that propelled the farm forward because just like your 4010 there, yeah. they put a turbo on it. Yeah. They added weights to it. They put saddle tanks on it. They went to six row planters instead of four row planters and they put the turbo on and the fluid in the tires and all that. And, you know, and I said that and I said, so that era tractor was when we, the demand for the output of the tractor grew so fast and those tractors, they did all that stuff to it and they took it. Yeah. They, they, they're still, you know, bulletproof. Yeah. And, And I said that in that video and this Alice guy gets on there and he goes, 190XT kick the shit out of either of them and i'm just like and i'm like stop it yeah <laughs> like just yeah. just and i i didn't have anything against the alice yeah because i got some friends that are alice guys but yeah. i'm like okay take your ego out of it yeah except like, the facts so then it just became yeah just i just needle them yeah all the time you know and kind of go after them and uh they're Relatively easy targets. Yeah. If I was going to needle anybody, I th- I'd go after the Oliver guys because when I was a kid, uh, we had the only loader we had when I was a kid was on that 60. We yep. had a mechanical, you Trip know, bucket. spring loaded dump bucket, you know. Yeah. And um, I can't remember what we were doing. Something that we were cleaning up, something we tore down, but our neighbor had an Oliver. That had a hydraulic loader with a with a hydraulic pivot uh, loader. Yep. And my dad borrowed that thing. And I don't think either me nor my brothers could run the fucking thing. It had so many levers, and I remember getting on it. And uh, my dad didn't let me run it because I was too young. But like my oldest brother, I remember him like chewing his ass because he wasn't able to do what he was supposed to. And I could just remember getting on there and, and being, it, it was like guy, like we talk about guys that to this day couldn't run a synchro. Yeah. I was, I was, I was like, this, this thing is. And from then on, I was like that Oliver, that's trash. No, but I don't want an Oliver. So I don't know. <laughs> Witnessed all the ass. It chewings. was all for me. It <laughs> could have been the greatest tractor ever, but I just was like that thing. Fuck that. Well, <laughs> Oliver and Alice both, like had their moments yeah. of like technological 
you know, Innovation. improvement that was like, wow. I mean, Oliver was early on with six cylinder engines yeah. and stre- they would streamline a tractor and styled a tractor when, you know, when Nobody Deer was. and Farmall had the steering gears exposed and the yep. steering wheel was straight. And I mean, Oliver, you know, had made they some beautiful spent the tractors. time. Yeah. They, yeah. and they were early on with good hydraulics. I think live PTO stuff like that. Yeah. And like Alice rubber tires, uh, turbochargers yeah like it's like oh they had so much going for him and then like alice had designed this uh you know lighting package that's so good for a tractor and, and, and all this they had going right and then they just mailed it in and they're just like well here the shifter for the transmissions <laughs> in the middle of the cab yep yep and you're like or or completely not put any development into the engine yeah you know because yeah. they small cubic inches terrible cylinder heads like that kind of stuff and you're like and i think it's because an international harvester did the same fate fell to international harvester and to oliver because oliver became was bought by white yep and white was trying to do a whole bunch of things same with international harvester did a whole bunch of different things alice was into create alice was building nuclear stuff oh power generation oh yeah they built reactors Holy shit. They're so, like fallout, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so they're doing all this stuff and they fell behind on their farm equipment and you know, whether or not guys hate yep. hearing it, but deer didn't do that. Deer, no, was deer stuck was with their very, farm equipment. And they were actually, they were, they were just very conservative. Very. Because definitely like you can, you can totally make the argument that when the boxcar Magnum came out, 4960, yeah. Deer was behind. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it didn't take them very long to catch up. And they waited until they had, I think, you know, yeah. they waited until they had it right. And nice cab. They did a good job. But people, people, I don't think anybody can claim that deer was very often revolutionary, but consistent. They were consistent, and everything yeah. they brought out was was a step change it was it was a step change and it was consistent in that everything stepped up and deer very rarely put out a lemon yeah i mean there's a few pieces of equipment that were crap that they came out with but in general deer wasn't putting something out that wasn't very refined where some of these other manufacturers introduced a tractor and it's like Oh, it had all these innovations, but it was like the D19 out, the first turbocharged farm tractor. Yeah. Horrible, horrible yeah. reputation on the D19 diesel. Yeah. And Deer wouldn't, you know. Yeah, Deer they was, wouldn't have done it. No, they were so late getting into the turbocharger game that because yeah. it had to be perfected. Yep, yeah. Before they would do it. But Deer was, Deer was revolutionary a few times. Yeah. You know, the 4010 changed agriculture. Right. No, and, it did. And the 8,000 series tractor, to this day, every tractor is based off that design. Yep, absolutely. You know, I was just talking with Nick about that. Today, we were talking about the Ford Genesis, and they were like, the Genesis guys would be like, well, they had Super Steer. Nobody even uses Super Steer anymore <laughs> yeah, because right. when they merged Case IH and New Holland together, they're like, well, we're going with the Magnum because yeah. it was simpler just to move the engine up and, and make them turn shorter than it was to have all the parts of, of yeah. Super Steer. And that's... they. They took that off a of deer. Yeah. And deer started on like the 8,000 series in the, I think the the first sketch, the guy, the engineer that did it was like on a napkin. He was on an airplane. That was in like the early 80s. Yep. But they took their time. And yep. once again, in the 80s, the farm equipment market shrunk. Yeah. They Why would you money. innovate? Right. Exactly mm-hmm. right. Where like Case IH, um, you know, they had to. Yeah. They had to do something because like International Harvester, that that right. 88 series or the 50 series they called it well and yeah when that all went south uh painting painting what 2394s red that yeah. wasn't selling very that no. wasn't selling very well no they so. had to i mean they had nowhere to go right you either quit or innovate or die quit. yep yeah. so that was and and that's where the the the, the 8000 series really hurt because yeah. You know, the red guys got the boxcar Magnum, had this wonderful tractor, yeah. and the 8000 series comes out, and suddenly they're behind again. Yeah. 
And if you look like those early MX Magnums that came out were plagued with problems and they don't sell well. They yeah. got it right. Yeah. But they, because the Deer 8000s introduced, you know, in like the fall of 94 or something, or they're 95 models, yeah. early 95. Yeah. You could get an 8000 series deer. Case IH is introducing the MX Magnum by 98. Yeah. That is fast getting it out. And yeah. it, they, they pushed it. They, they had to. It. They had to. Yep. Yeah. Well, okay. We we keep going. We we were talking about your social media that we pulled ourselves right back into Tractor Talk, which is great. But so what made you decide to start doing YouTube? And what's your YouTube handle? Okay, so it's Ryan Kelly dash WI Titan two. Yeah. So what made you make that jump? So back when I was twenty three years old, when I went back to college, well, I was farming. Um I thought I was somewhat academic at the time, you know, and get a little, you know, wear a lot of Abercrombie clothes and occasionally even a oh, turtleneck, yes. you know. Um, I thought I could be an author. <laughs> nice. And, yep. and I've always thought I'd love to write a book, but it's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, and we were, I was at a buddy of mine's farm one day and we used to screw around tractor pulling all the time with stuff, you know, we were at his place drinking beer and, you know, messing in the shop. Yep. And his dad came in and Dad is an old dairy farmer, you know, worked, worked hard. And we were talking about something, and he gets talking about his 4010 was there. His dad was talking about his 4010, and he almost teared up. Yep. And, I mean, this 4010 was looked like yours. It was beat up. It yep. it done a so lot much of work. work in its life, you know. And and this old farmer is talking about this 4010 like it's, I mean, it's. Part of the family. Yeah, it is. And I went, you know, that's so much cooler to listen to than the guy that's like talking about his orchard model you yeah. know all fuel engine you know that they only made three of that was out in you know oregon doing yeah. you know tree fruit stuff or whatever and it's like yeah but your your farm is in you know western minnesota you didn't grow tree it because fruit. it's rare yeah it's yeah. just a a trophy yeah. mm -hmm. a, a tractor and monetarily yes that's worth way more than that old 4010 right but that story that, yeah the because that means more to me mm -hmm. than you know or like some of those really oddball tractors it's like well they're oddball because yeah, nobody, wanted, nobody them, wanted them you know <laughs> so to get that connection to yeah. me seemed really important and and some of these old farmers are very quiet and then you get them going yeah you know, you might ask them a few questions and they're pretty quiet. You get them talking about that tractor. Yeah. And they change. Yeah. And they come I, out of their show. Yeah. And I really like that. So how many, how many episodes of the YouTube have you done so far? It's been about two and a half months. Okay. I think. Yeah. Pretty so recently. once a week. Yeah. 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 I really enjoy it. So um, I've watched them and the one that you just put out, uh, I thought was really interesting. The guy with the 1206. Yes. I really like that. Yep. And you're getting good traction on it. But I think that's a, I think that's a, I don't think anybody's really telling that story. No. I, because like I said, you'd have um, like uh, these guys that would do classic tractor stuff. Mm -hmm. Like the, the classic tractor TV. I used to watch some of that, you know, and the guy will go and it's like, here is my, Blah blah blah. My my, you know, cock shut. Oh yeah. Uh, utility. Yep. Uh, diesel that you know they only made four of, yep. and you know this the other two two of the other ones have scrapped, so there's only two left in the world yeah. or whatever. And the guy's like, we handmade half the parts on this yeah. one. Yeah. Yep. And it's like, oh, so what do you, what do you do with it? Well, I buff it with a diaper. Yeah. <laughs> and some of these guys don't even farm. Yeah. Right. And I, there's nothing wrong with liking equipment and not being a farmer not yeah. everybody gets to farm there's there's nothing wrong with that but there is something about a guy that you know his life has been using that thing yeah using that tractor like, that made his farm and the farm is his life and they're so connected to that that it's like that's way more interesting to listen to mm -hmm. so i was like well that's cool no that that's really deep and yeah, that's awesome. I think that is unique as hell. And like nobody that has like nobody outside of ag would see the 
Well, not, I would guess not. I guess that's, I'm just making an assumption, but nobody would recognize the value in that if you weren't a farmer. Like you have yeah. first world experience of just living that and knowing that and seeing that, you know. Yeah. Like that's a, that's a, that's a great concept for like an actual, you know, a TV it, show. That's, yeah. They what, do it with cars all the time. You got yeah. Jay Leno, you know, doing yeah. the car stuff and everybody's always showing cars and the connection they have with the car. But yeah, I think what you're saying about, yeah, I, I think it goes Working deeper than that day. because, yes, like the the tractor is the tractor is a vehicle. You're really kind of recording history from a farmer's point of view of a generation. Oh, you know because it's the tractor, but it's the story. Like that guy, the guy yeah. with the twelve oh six. I I keep going back to that because. I just thought it was so interesting because I learned something that I didn't know as far as how he, when he was daring and like all the stuff he did and just, yeah, just each, each person that you do their life experience and having that preserved is, is great. Is is so interesting because I've said this, I, I don't know how many times I've said this, my greatest regret of this podcast is that we didn't start it when my dad was still alive. So I tell so many stories that got handed down to me. Yep. But he could have told them a whole lot better than I did. And, you know, there's people for every one of those guys that when that generation passes, they'll cherish having that story that you got them to tell. Because those are all memories that, you know, children probably have. Um, but it's preserved now. And that's, so I've had, you know, a few people that I know, just people that I know, yeah. you know, not like necessarily haters or anything, but just people saying, cause I've asked a couple of old guys and they're like, I don't want to do that. You don't need to be talking about that kind of stuff. And I'm, yeah. I'm like, that's fine. You, that, that's say what you want. Yeah. Um, but I, I really think that you're missing out. Mm -hmm. because that matters to somebody mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. uh, and it, it's, there's people that, that don't know the guys that I'm, mm -hmm. you know, talking to, yeah. but they know a guy like that, mm -hmm. that yep. reminds them of that. Oh, mm -hmm. hundred percent. Also gives people a perspective yeah. on just how hard it, how much hard work it took and how hard they worked and, you know, for young people, that's, we need more people telling stories about well, the suck, the hard, the stories of that stuff. That really got me going. Like once I was on TikTok, that really motivated me on this was because you'd hear the younger guys, especially like your generation talking about, I wish these boomers would retire. So, cause they want more ground. Mm -hmm. We want, we want a farm. So I wish these boomers would retire. And it's like, <laughs> if you had to cultivate all summer long until the corn got too tall with an open station tractor with, yep. you know, every single day, would you still want to farm as bad as, yeah. so for a lot of these guys, like just think of your dad when he finally got into that 78, 20 cab. Yeah. After a lifetime of doing what he had. Why would why, he not want to farm? Right. Why, why <laughs> yeah. should he? It's the yeah. easiest time he's had right. his whole life and you could actually enjoy it. You can, yeah. you could, you know, chop stocks and listen to Rush Limbaugh. AC. Yeah. Well, and, and like, um, like I really like Zach Johnson. Yeah. Um, like Larson farms and those, they, they do great mm -hmm. stuff, but so the average people is, is tuning into the YouTube farmers and they, they think YouTube farming is really cool. Mm -hmm. And, and so they look at somebody that, you know, sits in this nice equipment and they put in long days in the spring and in the fall. And, and we know a farmer can stay busy all year long, yeah. all mm -hmm. year long. but it's like, it looks pretty fun and pretty yep. easy with these guys with all new equipment and all this. Yeah. And even some of the guys that don't have new equipment that, that have a YouTube channel, some of that is just so they can have a YouTube channel. Yes. You know, so these guys are the ones that it's like, oh, they did this the hard way, and it was not for cred on social media or... Right. I mean, these guys... Just to survive. Yeah, these guys could outwork you know, anybody, these people, anybody today farming. Yeah. And they, they did that without asking for, 
attention mm-hmm. or it was just I I have to pay for this. I mean there's 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 no way I'm yeah. going to get out of this. You know, I have yeah. to work. Uh, that whole that whole generation and that time there I mean it's I just saw this the other the other night some random guy on on TikTok but he said, you know, if you if you want to succeed at anything and you decide that this is this is what you're going to do, then you got to burn the boat. You got to burn the boat. You got to you have to go all in. Go all in and eliminate anything that is plan B. Your plan B or plan C. Well, that generation, there was no plan B or C. No. It was it was that or shit or get off the pot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean they they had all they had all uh they were all in. So well and especially some of like in John's case there yeah bought the cows in seventy six. Yep. Farming looked as good as it was as possible yeah. in nineteen seventy six. You step into this, you by nineteen eighty he's building a brand new setup. The eighties hit. Yeah. And I mean everything he had worked for at that point, it was survival. Yep. Then and these guys did yep. it that that the landscape forever changed from these guys and you know save as much of that now as we can because the sad part is as there's less and less farmers yep that you know so it used to be there there's always been less farmers it's always been yep. getting smaller but it's going so rapidly now. So yeah. when I was a kid, somebody would retire and they would sell um, they would have their auction and maybe they would rent the farm out and somebody would rent that farmstead from, or they would sell it and they would move. They'd build a house. They build a new house. They sold the farm. Somebody would come to that farm and they would farm at that farm. Yeah. Nobody does that. Now. Nope. Somebody They'd level it. Yep. Somebody owns that building site. You know, somebody will, around us, there's enough demand for houses. They want yeah. the house. And that just gets absorbed. So it's not being replaced. Yeah. And, and that's going away. The silos, the, and you know, and those guys built all that Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just disappearing. Yep. And I, I, there's lessons in there. If we, if you want to learn them. Yeah. If, if we can learn from these guys, I think, you know, I, I read a book years ago, and it was this old farmer that was, he was dying. He was terminal. And he started doing like a really early blog or something. This is like early 2000s, mid 2000s, something like that. And he was, they were bulldozing a, a building site. And he, he stumbled around one of the buildings and found something. You know, it was like a, I don't know, it was a, a cow chain or something that had been on, you know, a, a dairy cow at this small Tethered. family or whatever, you know, something like that. And he, he said he felt really sad and and wishes that agriculture didn't go the way it did because he said it was a better time when that was his friends when he was a kid mm-hmm. he played in that at yeah. that farm with those kids there yeah and you know these guys have so much knowledge and it takes time to get there because when you're young you're like I'm going to set the world on fire mm-hmm. I am gonna hell or high water I'm gonna make this work and. I feel the biggest problem in agriculture right now is greed. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're, you know, enjoy farming for what it is. Cause like how many new combines do you need to drive? (laughs) You can only drive one, right? Like, so do you need to, you know, cause people, well, I was telling you the other day when people say, well, we need to get it young people involved in agriculture. You hear that all the time. We don't get enough young people involved in agriculture. There's no shortage of young people that want to farm. Yeah. There's no opportunity. Mm-hmm. Nope. You know, it's like, well, yeah, they want you to come be a young person involved in agriculture. We want you to haul grain. That's all you're doing is, is hauling back to the, the bin site, you know, yeah. 24 I'll, hours a day in the fall. And, and drive the interrogator in the summer. Yep. That, that's what we want you to do for, you know, Seventeen dollars an hour. Yep. You're never gonna be able to have your own farm. And the minute we can replace you with autonomous technology, we're going to do that. Yep. So why would a young person even want to do that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if there was, 
so maybe you know maybe some somebody out there is this massive farmer getting bigger and they might stop and think for a second and they're like it wouldn't kill me to let that piece of ground just go and let somebody else yep you know because there's going to be one farmer eventually the way the way it's going there will be one farmer yeah Mm -hmm. he'll be the last one yep last man standing yep he has it all and that kind of leads into our next this question here are you hopeful that your kids will have the opportunity to farm will it be possible if they want to yeah full-time eh they're gonna have to do something or maybe they would marry another farm kid and they could combine some things but um farm out of the plat book now that's not a bad option get the plat you can make that work i know you can swing it that's I not married a bad for way love. To go. Had I had I known it differently, I, looking at it now, like yep. you know, <laughs> yep. and I guess I'm gonna let them figure it out because I mean I, I've spent a fortune on toy tractors for my kids over the years, yep. and sometimes they're interested, sometimes they're not. Right? Um, boy, you better want this mm-hmm. real bad. You figured that out, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because monetarily, actual dollar wage you're earning, you're working awful hard for not a lot of cash money. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So you better get some satisfaction and passion from this, or otherwise you're wasting your time. Yeah. If, mm-hmm. if, if, there's, if this is the only thing for you is just monetarily – Ooh, find something else. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, but if if you want it bad enough, you know, you can make it work. But I think a lot of people just have to just be okay with you're not going to be the BTO. Yeah, you don't have to be the BTO. Like, you know, would would you would you take farming full time if that's all you had to do? Roll crop, cash cash crop. If it was a few hundred acres and your big tractor was a forty four or fifty five, yeah, that'd be uh, all right, wouldn't it? Sweet yeah, deal. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. If you love, if you there's some real advantages to living where we live and being your own boss. Mm-hmm. If you value those two things, farming's a pretty damn good deal. It is. If you want to be able to travel a lot, have a lot of widgets. Well, if you want to be rich. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you said. I mean, the other thing that's also working in this generation is entrepreneurship, business, money. It's shoved down our throats. Like Consumerism. You want to be the 1%. You want to have the nice experiences in life. And the Instagram posts of, we're here, or we got this toy, it's just more and more all the time and like we've grown up with that my generation we've grown up with that like it's all about the status it's all about what you got it's all about that and so yeah i mean i think i think young people like you said they they like the idea of farming but are you willing to accept the reality of it like that you're probably you can't have it both ways you can't i mean and honestly I have, we're not, I don't have any experience being a BTO, but like I've heard people that on podcasts, you know, it's a hard business to be running a lot of acres, a lot of equipment. And if you're hiring people to help you, it's a lot. I mean, it's business is hard, but running a big farming business, oh, that is, that's tough. That is a tough, tough life. Yeah. We talked about that outside. Yeah. It's like, that's I think that's one of the that's one of the things that really thins out the herd because there's a lot of guys out there that love farming and they love the idea of like it's it's a contest. You want to get to the point do you have a fresh line of equipment yeah. and you're running big acres. The problem you get into is by the time you get there it's not going to be not enough. The one you're not the one running the equipment because you ain't got time to run it. Right. You're a glorified HR. You're a business. I mean, you're a business owner. At the end of yeah. the day, you're 
you're, you're a CEO. in an office and you're managing that. And yep. if your passion was farming, if your passion was having your ass in the seat, technician, yeah, you're going to be a miserable son of a bitch. Yeah, because you're so, not even scouting your crop. You don't have time to scout crop. No. So you're the agronomist is doing it for you. So yeah. you're not even getting dirt on your boots there. Yeah, um, you know you're not tinkering with a tractor in the shop. There's right. no. It's deer comes out. Yep. Takes care of the least stuff. I mean, is that is that worth it? Yeah. Um and like I said, And there's some people that it is. There's some people that are geared to that 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 can manage that. Obviously there are. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a lot of people that are at that bubble and they're they're not that great of managers. Or they don't want to be. Or they don't want to be. But, but they, they're stuck on this wheel now yeah, where... They built this thing. Now it's a monster. Yeah. And there's... And that's mm, a bad place to be. Yep. And I feel like, I mean, we're doing... It's, we're not do a lot of doom and gloom, but we're kind of in the doom and gloom of it. But this is just the reality. And I mean, on the show, Dad and I always talk about just like, you know, we try to find the answer. We try to think, scheme up ideas of like, well, it's you might be able to have a smaller farming operation, but you're probably going to have to have a business off the farm. Yep. You're going to have to do social media. If you raise livestock, you're going to try to have to, you're going to have to try to create your own market. Maybe, you know? Yep. And I feel like that's the only way you're going to be able to have a small farm quote unquote and keep it going. You're going to have to get smart with bringing income in in other ways or else you're going to have to, Grow. Marry a doctor. Yeah. I think that. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. <laughs> Just don't marry a psychiatrist. Yeah. That would be oh, really, really bad. Oh, oh, because she's she's <laughs> going to be like, this doesn't even make sense. <laughs> no, yeah. Just, just, she's going to commit your ass is what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I, I think it shouldn't be all doom and gloom. Yeah. Like, but... Because, I mean, I don't know, how do you change it? You know, that's my thing. Because, like, I, for me, if I focus on the doom and gloom, that's what will make me go, well, yeah, what am I doing here? I got to have my mind thinking about, okay, what can I do? Because I'll just tell you flat out, I don't want to be farming thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. No. I'm happy with getting to 1,000, maybe getting to 1,200 having some livestock, doing the social media thing and being happy there, you know. But just to be able to farm to enjoy it because is is, is the goal. Yes. Yeah. And too many people overshot that mm -hmm. or, you know, so if like at the end of the day, if you had a six row planter instead of a twenty four row planter. So if you had a six row planter in a 160 horsepower tractor was your big tractor and uh you know you still use augers to fill your grain bins not yep. a leg and you didn't have a tower dryer you had a small yep. six panel dryer or something like that but you made a living full-time farming yep. on that you made a living was isn't that just as good as the guy with the yep you know so maybe you aren't taking the seed corn trip that the company's yep. paying for you but if you're too stressed out and worried about it the whole time anyways, right. just enjoy what you have. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be bigger or grow your business, but I think too many people forget, too, that it's like, well, I'm hung up on the on the acres thing. We're going to continue yeah. to grow. How about just doing a way better job with what you have? Because that's moving forward, too. Yep. It's like, well... We're going to run more acres. That's that's the only way through this. Meanwhile, you've got fence lines that have grown up everywhere, and you're not yeah. farming 20 feet of every single field that you have fence lines around, right. or or you got this wet spot that needs some Tile. tiling. Get your get your fertility right. This or that. Yep. That's that's a bigger deal. Mm -hmm. 100%. Than, you know, I I told a big farmer one time, and I don't think he liked it, but I said if you want to farm all fall, you know. You could just buy a forty twenty. You know they were running around with a bunch of combines and and yeah. everything else. And I'm like, well, if you just if you just want to spend every minute farming, you could just buy smaller equipment. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's and how many times are guys just farming for the equipment? Yeah. 
is a friend. Well, that's the sad truth of the matter is, is yeah, you we've gotten in this cycle that you want to run bigger equipment, then to justify the equipment, you got to run more acres, and then guess what? You're just wearing out that equipment. It, I mean, it, it's a it's a vicious circle. It really is. What's well, I'm I'm gonna buy a new combine, and then I'm gonna go do custom work to make the payment. Pay for on the it. combine. And you're like, oh, I got the combine payment made. Oh, the combine needs a lot of work now. Where if you would just had your older combine and did your your small yep. farm, man, I'd probably live a long time. I mean, Tony broke the internet. Oh yeah, with that ninety five ten or ninety six ten. Yeah, right. Because you know, when him and I talked, so I got a ninety five ten. Yeah, and uh, um, it's like a lot of people were blown away that this thirty thousand dollar combine was able got him all through fall, go through harvest, and yep. it's like that. The combine and heads were less than the depreciation had he bought a brand new combine mm-hmm. and ran it that one season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, you know, years ago, so that's the other thing with his equipment today. So 30-year-old equipment today is fine to operate. Just like oh, a, it's, yeah. It's, you could drive a 30-year-old pickup truck, right? Like yeah. a 30-year-old pickup truck wouldn't be. But yeah. 30 years ago, a 30-year-old what it was yeah you tracks. couldn't you couldn't it yeah it's not even close no you could not like the yield penalty yeah like if you have a good 30 year old planner and a good 30 year old combine it'll it's yeah. capable of doing anything you need it to do right yeah. where 30 yeah. years ago it was like yeah if you got a 7200 if you're going from a if you're going from the latest and greatest to a 7200 planner that you've gone through yeah probably going to work fine now, yeah. if you go back to a 595 or whatever, what yeah. draw and John Deere planner with, yeah, with you're going to pay, yeah. pay a penalty. Yeah, you're not that. going to get, yeah. So we've, we've reached a point where, I mean, some of this equipment is, yeah, is redundant. And actually, we've created ourselves more headaches with some of this equipment because it's so much technology that we're chasing, trying to keep technology going that I think, you know, the sweet spot was, 90s whether you know even look at look at vehicle look at diesel mm-hmm. pickups 100 mm-hmm. percent. you know i mean they, they the were they were really awesome stroke. 20 years ago yep. you know and now it's like oh yeah so if that goes out you have to remove the entire cab to fix this it's <laughs> you know oh that's good to know yeah seven thousand dollars later well i was just gonna say last thing i'll say about the whole family farm thing and everything's got to get bigger the irony of it all is I think the American the consumer does not want that to happen. Does not want family farms to go away. Doesn't want agriculture to get bigger. But yet, that's how it's getting, that's what's playing out. And I don't think I don't think most people that have no idea how ag works don't even realize it. Yeah, but well, they're gonna wake up because you see it. People hate Monsanto. People yeah. hate Bear. They hate Smithfield. They hate Smithfield. Yep. They hate these huge corporations, these huge efficient corporations and machines. But they like cheap prices. They like cheap prices. They yeah. like the way that it is, but they don't realize that that's affecting the one thing that they don't want to have die. The prop, the American farmer is too damn good at it, and that's been his downfall. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the American people never... If there's there has not been any any kind of thought of famine in this country no. in centuries. No, because now the Europeans are so damn dumb they're headed back. Oh my gosh, they're headed back the wrong direction. <laughs> there will be a famine in Europe at some point. I'm convinced of that because they're gonna they're gonna ruin that they're gonna ruin that continent to where there will be no agriculture left over there. We'll they just we'll just it. cap it at that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of technology, if we don't cut this off, our technology is gonna <laughs> not totally gonna work. Freaking crash. Oh. Yeah, oh. we're this the we we got we tried maxing out our RAM on our computer and that worked and it's helped us. But if we get over two hours, we're just about at two hours here. We start having fits on the computer. Okay. So we're gonna have to cut it short. So we'll we'll fire off a few questions for you and then we'll wrap it up. So what's next for you? What's next in your world? What do you what do you want? Like, what's your goal with everything you're doing? Whether it be farming, whether it be the channel, whether it be just continue to raise the family. Love to grow the farm some if I could, but just do a better job with it. Um, concentrate more on that. Less quit spending money so I don't have to do other stuff would really help. I don't have an <laughs> income problem, I have a spending problem. Um, 
But uh, I think just doing that going forward, the continue. I do enjoy like the, the arguing with people about tractors on TikTok is fine. Yeah. But I, I, I genuinely have a passion for the like doing these tractor stories. stories. And, this, and and I try not to be I try to be colorblind when I do that. Now that one where I made the Massey comment, that was just that was that was <laughs> Pavlovian. Like that. that was just completely yeah. out of the blue. Like I like that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. uh I, I you know, maybe we can get some company that's willing to sponsor that or or maybe, you know, um, you know, a, a media company would be willing to, you pick know, a up. farm journal or something like that would, would pick that up and yep. actually produce it. I don't want to overly produce, but, you know, do it a little better than me, mm-hmm. you know. Last thing, where could people find you again? Because we want to make sure that people do go check out your stuff and follow you and see what you're up to. Yep. So um, Ryan Kelly dash WI Titan 2 on YouTube. Um, TikTok, just WI Titan 2. It'll come up. Um, and, uh, yeah, pretty simple. To- now, now that I am thinking of it, are you a Packers fan? Um, not a big sports guy. Okay. Well, that's all right. I was just I mean, going to say, if you were, you could have had a chance to give me shit about my Cowboys, but that's good. I, no strife here. Hey, I get too it. Busy. Too, too busy. busy. Too busy. I get it. Well, I, I don't dislike yeah. the Packers at all. Like I, I was hoping the Packers were going to beat the 49ers, but, yeah. uh, they didn't, I didn't watch the game. I yeah. just. Look the next day. I'm like, oh, they lost. There's only so much room in your in in your uh, before you run out of space up there. And, yeah, <laughs> and farming takes up a lot of it. And then four kids, yep. my yep. wife, and then I have one older. It's almost your age. That, mm-hmm. uh, there's just not enough time in the day. Yeah, I, I guess I got more important stuff to worry about yep. than it. But yep, you know. All right. Well, I think that's gonna wrap it up. So if you guys got any value. Please share the show. Share it out with who you know. Uh, leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Submit your questions for our Q&A episodes at barntalkshow at gmail.com. And uh, Ryan, we appreciate you coming on the show. Safe travels back to where your yeah. home is. And we'll see you guys back here next week for another episode. <laughs>